You're listening to Language Nerds Do Earth, the podcast about linguistics, culture, travel, and how they're all connected. Now it's time for your language nerd hosts. One in China, one in Spain. It's Patrice and Rachel. back to Language Nerds to Earth. This is episode number 15. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we've got some pretty interesting stuff this episode. So the topic this week is the expat lifestyle and what it's like mm-hmm. to be an expat. Mm-hmm. And so we talked to two people who are mid to long term expats and mm-hmm. got to know a little bit about their experience. Yeah, so first we'll look at the number of expats growing in the world. Uh, We'll look at kind of how that number has changed over time. And then we'll hear from our guests. One is a millennial expat and the other is a lifetime baby boomer expat. And just kind of hear about their story, what's easy and what's hard about it, what's changed about them as people, uh, what they like and don't like, and they'll give us some advice about being an expat. Yeah. So then we have a lost in translation story from Nia in New York. Mm Mm-hmm. Awesome. But first, we have some very sad language news. Yes. Yes. This week is not as happy as last week when we talked about smiles. Everybody has probably heard of this news by now. Yeah. So if you haven't heard, Coco the Gorilla has died. Coco was the first gorilla that was able to learn sign language with her guardian, Penny. Mm -hmm. And this is really important for linguistics because prior to Coco, I know that language research trying to teach animals to speak started in the 1930s, but prior to Coco, they didn't think it was really possible. But she learned, I want to say... Over 500 words? Yeah, the article said um, she could understand uh, around 2,000 words of spoken English. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember watching or reading an article about her a few months ago, and it was like, apparently she had lost a baby, mm-hmm. and somebody who was working with her, one of the, one of the researchers, also lost a baby, and... You know, Coco was, like, kind of annoyed with this researcher who was gone for a few months because of the incident. And so Coco was like, so where were you? And the researcher said, you know, I lost a child, Coco. And Coco, like, got really quiet and, like, showed serious empathy. It's really, really amazing that, like, a gorilla can relate to your experience as a human, you know? Hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, uh, she definitely was important for proving cognitive abilities mm-hmm. or showing cognitive abilities. So apes are not physically able to produce speech like we can. Their vocal cords are different, mm-hmm. but the cognitive part is there. And mm-hmm. I think it's, uh, I think I've read that she had like the ability to express herself equal to that of a toddler or four or five year old or something like that. Mm-hmm. But even more than that, she was really famous for her love of little baby things, all things baby. Yeah, there's like this really famous picture of her that goes around on the internet every once in a while of her and a kitten. And yeah, it's really sweet how she she just loved kittens, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And she was given a kitten when she was fairly young, I think. I think it was in the 70s. Um, mm-hmm. And the kitten got hit by a car, if I'm not mistaken. <gasps> oh, no. And so, so there's sweet. like a video of the news being delivered to her and she is just like she freaks out and she goes into a mourning and it's if you haven't seen the video it's really really 
sad but touching. That's really upsetting. Apparently, also, she hung out with Robin Williams for a day in, like, 2001. And there's a video of her hanging out with him and, like, laughing with him in a trailer. <laughs> and, like, it's apparently she, like, steals his glasses and, like, runs away with him. <laughs> And then when she was told about Robin Williams' death, um, she got, like, really quiet and she remembered him. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a debate, you know, about that. Like, oh, maybe we're just projecting our emotions onto her. But also the thing with the kitten. Mm -hmm. I think think you're right. Their their genetics are 98% similar to humans. I thought it was more, actually. Is it? Yeah. I thought it was 99-something. I believe it. But, yeah. I mean, I'm totally 100% in the camp of them being fully capable of expressing emotion and empathy. Mm -hmm. Most most animals, in fact. I agree. I agree. Yeah, Coco the gorilla. And if you watch a video of her interacting with her guardian... She's producing her own speech. Mm -hmm. She's coming up with new thoughts. So, like, for example, there's this one part where her guardian, Penny, is like, okay, um, I need you to please pick up that thing over there. And Coco says, finished. And then she walks over and, like, sits down. I don't don't know what, what she expects to happen next. But Penny's like, no, you are not finished. And Coco's like, yep, totally finished. Finished. You are not finished. You are not. You are not finished. You didn't do the work. I asked. Please pick those up, Coco. You are very good at that. Please. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like she's stubborn and she has real personality traits. You yeah. know, gorilla nality. Like a like a young child. Like, mm-hmm. can I get away with this? <laughs> yeah. And one more thing. Um, actually, she has a friend. His name is Michael, and he's, like, the alpha male. And apparently he learned, he also learned something like over 500 signs. And and this was so crazy. Um, They asked him where his mom was one time, Mm -hmm. and he used the, the vocabulary he had to describe, like, poachers. So he, he says something about, like, sharp tooth, cut neck and um, smash meat or something like that. So they're pretty sure his mother was a victim of poachers, and he watched as they, like, cut her apart for meat. Oh, my God. Yeah. Apparently he's kind of a quiet gorilla. Like, he he's not as expressive or excited as Coco was, and they think, like, that might have something to do with his personality. Wow. Like, his trauma. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> well, okay. <laughs> moving on. Sets the mood. <laughs> so, we found this article about the number of expats in the world. And we, it's not super clear from the article, but we're pretty sure that it's referring to expats from all over the world mm-hmm. um, instead of just American expats. Because in 2013, the total number of expats grew to 50.5 million. So this is kind of an older article, but they expected it to go up to 56.8 million. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at like a compound annual increase of 2.4% since 2009. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely, we're definitely in that category. We became expats since then. Yep, that's true. Oh, we should probably define the term expat. Yeah. So, what is an expat, an expatriate? Mm -hmm. An expat or expatriate is someone who lives outside of their country. Mm -hmm. Is there a time limit on that? For at least... No, I don't think so. uh, Well, I mean, yeah, I guess, like, if you move abroad for any period of time, you're considered an expat. That's true, yeah. Although, I do get a a different sensation when... Um, maybe it's a group of students who are there for like a semester, you know? Right. I wouldn't consider them expats. When I say that I have lived in Spain and Germany, I don't even 
I don't even really consider that living. I consider that studying. Right. So, so yeah, moving, they don't really move abroad. They just study abroad. Yeah, I guess some students do study full-time abroad, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Um, those who go on, like, uh, Erasmus or a study a year or a semester abroad, I don't... It's a different kind of world, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, they're in they're in a bubble. Although it is, it is like very challenging. That's no disrespect to students who study abroad. No, uh, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we both did it, and it can. It's not easy. That's yeah, for sure. It's just a little bit different of a of an experience. I think. Mm-hmm. I yeah, think it's it more is. about you're coming together with students from either other countries or mm-hmm. uh, you're in a program and you're with people from your own university or something and it's a good exchange I think yeah so when I first heard the term expat I somebody called me and I was like well I'm not an expatriate like I'm still like I remember being a little bit taken aback by the term okay um just because I I didn't know what it meant and then so It has kind of a weird, like, you hear it for the first time, and it's like, it sounds like you've denounced your home. Yeah, it does sound like that. (laughs) Yeah, but it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that you've you've moved abroad. And now, for me, it has a very positive connotation, but sometimes I'll talk to people in the U.S., and I'll say something about the expat lifestyle, and they'll be like, what is expat? And I, I think they might hear you know oh expatriate so you know you're not interested in your home anymore (laughs) yeah that's true you hate Mm -hmm. your home yeah you just wanted to move as far away as possible right 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 (laughs) and that's not what it is no Uh, yeah exactly yeah so the majority of expats in 2013 were individual workers that was 73.6 percent of them and then 8.8 percent were students so i guess in this article they do consider expat uh, students to be expats Mm -hmm. and then 3.7 percent were retired expatriates and one percent were corporate transferees which i was surprised that that wasn't higher yeah me too but maybe it's increased since 2013 and then the remaining 12.8 percent is non-employed spouses and children. Mm-hmm. That's pretty high, actually. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of families, mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people who move would move with their families. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, Rachel and I are in that huge chunk, the majority category, individual workers. Right. So in the study, they looked at 30 countries. And of those 30, I was really surprised by this. The largest number of expats were moving to Saudi Arabia, Mm -hmm. followed by United Arab Emirates and the USA. Mm, Yeah, it's because of that oil. I guess 2013 was a good year for oil. And I mean, if you're in the English teaching world, you know that Saudi Arabia, it's less so now, but it was kind of like where you went to make a whole lot of money Mm. to teach, whether it's English or teaching in an international school or whatever. And the UAE is also one of those. It's a good deal. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I would be interested to see what the number is now in 2018. And uh, especially with the economic... I mean, the situation in the U.S., the stock markets are doing pretty well, but wages have stagnated or decreased, and the underemployment rate is really, really high, I think. That's not a number that is really easy to prove. Yeah. So I'd be interested to see how that has changed. I know that, like, in Oklahoma, teachers are oh yeah running for the hills they just like for example left everyone left yeah i watched a an interview a vice interview of some different teachers and one of them was like i'm going to china to teach because i feel more valued as a teacher there i think i saw the same interview <laughs> oh really yeah <laughs> nice yeah cool so yeah we talked to two people about being expats 
Rachel, would you like to introduce your guest first? Sure. So I interviewed my friend Zahir. We met in Spanish class last year, and yeah, he's been living here for a while. A very Mm -hmm. special guest today. Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? I mean, sure, but now that you've said special guest, I feel (laughs) like there's a lot of pressure on me to do something good. Uh, Yeah, my name is Zahir Ali. And I am an expatriate living in Madrid. Uh huh. Just like you. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Could you tell me like a little bit about some different places that you've lived and how long were you there? And okay, so I was born in Carrollton, Texas, uh, which is like a little suburb of Dallas, and I lived there until I was seven years old. At which point, my parents and I uprooted and went to live in England, in Croydon, you know, South mm-hmm. London. And I lived there until I was 22. So I went to school there, went to university there, got my first job there and everything. Then I came to live in Spain, where I've been living ever since. So do you, this is a little bit off topic, but do you consider yourself, I guess, more British or more American? Complicated question. It really is a complicated <laughs> question. And the more I think about it, the more complicated it gets. I've honestly just started thinking of myself as a nomad because it's just easier to get by. (laughs) Okay. Interesting. But English is definitely your your mother tongue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, I interviewed my husband's aunt, actually. Her name is Patty. Hi. uh, My name's Patty Moore. I've been living in Bangkok, Thailand for 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And before that, I lived in Karachi, Pakistan for about four Mm -hmm. and a half, five years. And before that, I lived in um, Montevideo, Uruguay and Lima, Peru for about a year. And before that, I was in Bonn, Germany for about five years. And many years before that, I was in Peru. But the, mm-hmm. you know, my first time as an expat was about three and a half, four years out in Peru. Man. Yeah. So how many countries is that for you besides the Oh, US? no, wait. Okay. Peru, Germany. Well, it's only four. Five. Five, counting Uruguay. Yeah. And I've been really excited about interviewing her for the show, actually, because she is one of the most interesting people I know. She lives in Bangkok currently, but she has lived all over the world. Very cool. Yeah. So first we wanted to know how they ended up going abroad, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually only visited Spain once before I moved here. And I was, this was just before I turned 22. Like I had my job and my friend who was living here, uh, her name was Jess. And she said, you need to come visit me in Spain. You can stay with me and we'll go do all this stuff. It'll be fun. So I came over for St. Patrick's weekend that year. And I just loved it so much. And like her and her sister put these ideas in my head Mm -hmm. that I didn't need to stay in England. And then suddenly I was just like, as soon as I got back to my parents, I was just like, mom, dad, I want to go live in Spain. Thus ensued a, I don't know. Let's say five months. A nice five month argument of me trying to get them to convince me to let me like move out to another country. Okay. Yeah, for me it was only supposed to be like a year long thing. Uh huh. And how long have you been here? Almost five years. Okay. <laughs> so apparently so you seem he to So he basically like it. was not feeling super satisfied with the life that he had in England mm. and ended up visiting A friend in Spain and deciding to move here. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, and I talked to Patty about why she was interested in going abroad in the first place. The the first time really was a combination of factors. I I was in um, a job that was it was a good job. It had you know definitely had you know future prospects and things. but it, but the future prospects weren't materializing as quickly as I wanted them to. <laughs> it's like mm-hmm. fair enough. I can and then, really do that. yeah, and then it was uh, then a gentleman. He had been a student at the University of Michigan in a program to learn to teach English as a second language to Spanish speakers, and because he had become kind of a minor celebrity in Charlotte 15 years before. 
the editor of the newspaper where I worked introduced me to him. And the long story short, he offered me a job in Peru, and I quit my job, picked up, and moved. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that nice. that's, yeah, that's the very short part of the story. The mm-hmm. longer answer is that you know, I had, from the time I was 12, wanted to be a New World archaeologist. And, of course, one of the countries I really thought I wanted to work in was Peru. So oh. when somebody offered me a job in Peru, it was a bit of a no-brainer. So she would be classified also as an individual worker in mm-hmm. this case. And we wanted to know also what it was like for them to adjust to life in a new place. Yeah. So we asked about some initial hurdles that they had to get over, as well as if they experienced any culture shock or things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I had a lot of uh, a little bit of culture shock, actually. I don't know, like the Spanish classes that I took helped to begin with, uh, because I really needed help getting to grips with the language. In England, like in secondary school, I took Spanish mm-hmm. for four years. And apparently I was good at it until this thing called the subjunctive appeared, and then I <laughs> failed horribly. <laughs> but then um, I just didn't use it and never practiced, but somehow managed to convince myself that I could still speak Spanish. <laughs> so when I went to Spain... I asked some guy for directions on how to get to this one place so my friend could pick me up from the airport. And he just, his mouth opened and it was like a machine gun of words that I didn't understand. And it was just like, downstairs. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Gracias. And I left. (laughs) Uh Uh Uh-huh. So very, very little is the answer to that question. (laughs) Okay. But at least you had some familiarity with it, so you could pick it up maybe later. Uh, I could read it. I could pronounce it well while reading it out loud, but I couldn't speak it and I couldn't listen to it. Okay. Which are two very important things if you want to survive in that culture. <laughs> and how long do you think it took you to be comfortable? like in Speaking Spanish? Yeah, speaking Spanish, like um, at least to get around and like feel comfortable d- doing day-to-day things. It took me maybe six months okay. to like really get a foothold with the language. It sounds like for both of them, the main part of adjusting was learning the language. It was learning like because like I said, I was fortunate because one of my housemates um, had been teaching in Peru, going back and mm-hmm. forth from the university where she taught in the States um, to the um, to the university in Peru. And and I and I so I had sort of a lot of in house cultural training. Ah, yeah, nice. Yeah. And yeah. and if it and if it didn't come from my housemates, then it came from their colleagues and friends. Oh. Uh, okay. so yeah, so that's that's yeah, that's really the way I learned. And then I, I can't remember. It, then at one point, the Fulbright professor, you know, went back to her university in the States. And then I shared a house for a while with one of my first housemates. And, and, and then one of our housemates was Peruvian, actually Peruvian. So there was another um, really in-house opportunity for me. I mean, like, again, live, this woman also was an academic, but living with... Um, living with another Peruvian woman and learning from her. So yeah. I, I had probably the best possible introduction <laughs> that anybody could have had. You've done this so many times now. You've moved from, you've moved to at least five different countries. Do you have like a routine for how you're going to adjust each time and do you think it takes you less time or? No, not really because um, it, every country is so different. But 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 what you do is you you improvise. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You you just you you see where you know where, where you have an opportunity, or you know somebody who knows somebody, and you can ask for help. And you just don't have to you have to not be afraid to ask for help. Definitely, yeah. I think that's really yeah. good advice. Yeah. So like my first my first year in Spain, I was living month to month. Not not because of a problem or anything. Just you know. That one year, I see it as like year zero. Like that was me finding my feet, figuring out how to be an adult, mm-hmm. and then doing it. 
So it sounds like it was a very maturing experience. Yeah. If anyone, like, I had this conversation with someone a while back, and they said, you know, why why is Spain so special to you? I was like, this is where I learned to be an adult. Mm-hmm. And then we asked about making friends as an expat. I think that's like a huge theme for any expat. Yeah. Friends come really quickly into your life, but they also tend to go really quickly from your life. So Yeah, yeah. And again, partly it depends on where you are as an expat. I mean in in some places the expat community is is much more stable. In other places it's much more transient. Bangkok tends to be a mix. Bangkok, Thailand as a country, has a fairly large, you know, like long time resident expat community. But it also it also has a, a really substantial community of people who are here for a few years for a particular job and then they're transferred or, or change jobs or whatever. Um, Lima was very different. Um, in Lima, the expat community when I first lived there was smaller and well, it tended to be probably more transient simply because um, Peru was at that time was coming off, you know, 11 years of a military dictatorship and there had not been that many expats really staying for long periods of time. So that that was a little bit different. Also, it, again, in in Germany, because when I moved there, my friends there were German. So that's who my friends tended to be, with the exception of the people that I was working with, and I was working in an international organization, so they were people from all over. And how did you meet people? How did you start to get a social group and all of that? <laughs> I don't know. So there was Spanish class that accounted for a lot of my socializing. I had my friend who lived here as well. I hung out with her quite a lot. And then beyond that, like to try and meet people and stuff, I would go to these things called intercambios, you know, Mm -hmm. language exchanges. You know, you'd go to a bar or the one I went to actually did like outings to the cinema. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, And then after that, again, through Spanish class, this, this one girl just inadvertently sorted my entire life out for me (laughs) she said oh why don't you do this program for work five years later you know i just finished doing that program (laughs) uh she's like uh oh i know someone who plays football in madrid if you're interested next thing you know i'm playing there every week still even now playing Mm -hmm. with those same majority of people her friend became my friend and then you know all of it just fell into place you know like that it was crazy honestly a lot of the socializing i've done in madrid has come through football. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Cool. So that was like a good way to meet a lot of people and kind of get a group of supportive people, I guess, right? I mean, if by supportive you mean people you go out with and drink heavily, then no. I could mean that. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm I'm just joking. Like, (laughs) you know, your friends, they'll always want to be there for you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important, uh, no matter where you move, like, to find that group of people that you can be with and they can help you out, you can help them out as well. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one thing that's, like, made me think a little bit about leaving. Last year, especially, two very good friends of mine, they left because of uh, relationships or life changes. And I remember sitting there just thinking, like, Jesus Christ, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep sitting here in this room at this time every year, having said goodbye to my, you know, to people who have become my closest friends. But unfortunately, it's part of the life. Do you find that also in Madrid? I have found that, yeah. The people that I was friends with mostly when I came here are not the people that I'm friends with now. Mm. So either they've moved on or they've gone back home or something, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm still working on that more established, settled group of friends. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's totally understandable. I think that's something that for you it's probably the same. I feel like I've learned to accept that everything in life is temporary, mm-hmm. uh, no matter how permanent it feels, and friendships are part of that, especially when you're an expat. Yes. And I, th- I think it's that establishing of that kind of a network Mm-hmm. of friendships where you d- you establish it wherever you live but the network gets to be spread out all over the planet mm-hmm. once you've lived as an expat you know for a few years and i think that may be you know one of the things that i appreciate the most about it 
mm-hmm. and you know, and that's living in aspect. yeah, 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 and li- yeah, and living in Bangkok, living in a in a place that's really an airline hub, that means that a lot of these people do get through here. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like more often than not, you know, for some right. reason, and um, and it's, it also means like when I'm on my way back from Algeria. Yeah, you know, like I, I fly, you know, I fly into Paris and then, you know, then, then fly to Algeria. But, but, but then on my way back to Bangkok, because I'm flying um, Etihad Airways, I'll, I'll stop over in Abu Dhabi because I've got a friend there who I haven't seen in years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah, and that knowing that there's a friend in sort of every airline hub and, you know, in lots of countries, it's, it, yeah, it's a good feeling. It's the world is your neighborhood. Exactly. Oh, oh, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I That's, just, I yeah. just made that up. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. You can copywrite that right now. And I thought they both gave pretty good advice about finding friends and also how to break in. I think Patty gives right. some good advice about how to how to actually break in to making local friends, which can be challenging. Oh, yeah, definitely. I totally related to what Zahir had to say about Spanish friends. So there's this thing about trying to make friends with like a group of Spaniards Mm -hmm. where, okay, in my experience, I found that a lot of Spanish groups of friends, to quote Drake, they started from the bottom, now they're here. (laughs) They came up through school, they did all of this stuff together, they're they're as thick as thieves, you know, that's them. And And if you try and infiltrate that, they'll be friendly with you, they'll be perfectly courteous, they'll go out with you. But they won't really trust you like one of their own. Right. Not without really putting in the work. Which is why I've always found it easier to hang out with expats here. Which I find quite sad really saying it, but I should have more Spanish friends by this point. Yeah, it's really difficult to break in. How most of them have grown up together and they've been really, really tight their whole lives. And then Mm -hmm. you try to get into that group and it's... It's impossible. It's, yeah. I have very few Spanish friends. I could count them on one hand. Mm -hmm. For the same thing, yeah. It's more of a culture of you keep your friends from when you grew up and you were four years old together and that's your same group of friends, like, until you die, pretty much. (laughs) It seems. Well, I mean, like, If you grow up in that culture, I'm sure it's really, really nice. Yeah. You know, I have friends from when I was six that I met when I was six. And when I do get to go home and see them and hang out with them, it's like, ah, yeah, this feels like so natural. And I can't believe we've both made it this far. (laughs) But it's not the rule for me. It's definitely more the exception. Yeah, definitely. But I, I thought it was interesting what Patty had to say that It really depends on where you are as far as whether or not you're going to make friends. Yes, she gives a lot of good examples about how the culture can either be um, something to help you or it can be a hindrance as well. But but I would also say that in Pakistan, it was amazingly fast. But there, I think it's because I my experience is that um, South Asian culture in most of its aspects, obviously not language, is very, very similar to Latin American culture. In the sense that even though the family is the center of really everything, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. social, cultural, you know, financial, in Latin American and South Asian culture, the family is really inclusive mm-hmm. and tends to like bring new people home and feed them and take care of them. Aww. And yeah, yeah. And, um, and in Southeast Asia, same thing. The family is the, the center, just like it is in South Asia or Latin America, mm-hmm. but the family tends to be exclusive. And that's, and now, you know, after, after a while, um, I found that that's not just my perception. That is, that is true. And that's the experience of a lot of people. What did you find in Korea? Again, I was a student, so it was a little bit different, but my Korean friends, I guess, were like, they had a mentorship program, so we were part of a group, but they were the ones, you know, interested in meeting foreigners, and... Yeah, I was kind of thinking that, like, the people who become your friends are often the ones, pretty much always the ones who are interested in in meeting foreigners, you know? Yeah, like, that was me in the U.S., too. Like, I, most of my students 
we're young adults. Shout out to Abdullah from our Ramadan episode. Yeah. And uh, I made friends with the students because that's who, because I'm interested in international people. So it's yeah. both ways. Yeah, for sure. I was going to ask you in China, have you found it easier to relate to expats or locals? Well, definitely it's easier to relate to expats, but it's much easier here than it was in Korea to relate to locals. People are okay. much more open. I had dinner with a Chinese friend a little while ago, and he connected me with one of his friends who's interested in something that I'm interested in as well. So it took me a lot longer to be able to go out with a Korean person when I was there. I remember suggesting it to somebody, and mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, we should hang out sometime. And they were like, ha 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 ha. And then that was the end of that conversation. (laughs) So another thing that we asked them was, has living abroad for an extended amount of time changed the way that they relate to people back at home? Mm -hmm. And I think they both more or less agreed with that. Mm -hmm. Has living abroad changed the way you interact with people in the U.S., do you think? Oh, yeah, because I've learned really quickly that people in the U.S. really do not want to hear what you've been doing when you're out of the U.S. Um, they <laughs> What they are interested in is telling you what's happened in the U.S. while you've been away. Oh. Yeah, so, so I, unless I'm asked, you know what I mean? I rarely volunteer information. Huh. I don't think I ever realized. Yeah, but, th- but that happened really early. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not so much with Austria, because when, when I went to school there, I was gone for a year and I came back. Mm-hmm. But, but once I moved, actually moved abroad and, and really lived as an expat, you know, with a job and my own place to live and things like that in another country, that's when I, that's when I noticed the change. Hmm. In terms of differently? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I know I always find when I go home, it's kind of like everything stays the same. It's only like my situation has changed a lot, but a lot of people's has stayed fairly similar. Or they still hang out with the same friends from high school. Or... Yeah. And they still go to the same place down the road. Yeah. You know. And it's like, oh, how's Spain? It's good. Cool. <laughs> and it's like, good talk. <laughs> and like, aren't you going to ask me about home? No, I can see it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how I feel when I go home. Really? No one is actually interested in what I'm doing. It's like, oh, how's Spain? Good. Okay, let, let me tell you about my life. And it's like... Yeah. Not with everybody, but most people, you know. Not with our moms. moms no. Moms, we love you. <laughs> no, not with, the, you know, not with our families for the most part. Mm. But, yeah, there's not a huge interest or there's not a huge, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, I mean, and I don't don't necessarily see it as a bad thing, as a negative thing. I think it's more of just a, we don't really get it. And so they don't feel like they can relate to it. Yeah. And if people don't feel like they can relate to something, they usually change topic, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just natural, you know, that seems like maybe something far away, distant, like, Mm -hmm. but they can tell me about their lives and I'm going to, I'm going to get it. And yeah, it's kind of like if somebody starts talking about like accounting to me, my eyes, like if it's just something that I really, really will never be interested in, no matter how many times I try to learn about it. It, like, my eyes glaze over, like, oh, no, make it stop. <laughs> Do you talk about accounting a lot? I don't know that I no, ever No, I just... <laughs> <laughs> no, but when it comes to, like, tax time, yeah. I'm, like, deductions and 401 number form. <laughs> What? Oh, no. It's not over yet. I want to go back to sleep. (laughs) So we also asked them about advice that they might have for people who are moving abroad or just moved abroad. And, I mean, their advice was spot on, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. I say do it. 
your city, your home, almost everything you know will be there if you ever decide to go back. Even if it's just for as little as a year, go out, do it, the experience, you know, it's personally enriching. You'll learn a lot about yourself, you'll learn a lot about another culture, and who knows, you might you might meet some people along the way that in the future might make a telling contribution to who you become as a person. Mm-hmm. If you've already done it and you've just done it, I would say stick with it because I know how difficult it can be those first few months. I honestly actually thought about going home, mm-hmm. like back to England. Thank God I didn't, I didn't stick with that idea. Everything's an adventure. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's kind of what you were saying too. Like everything is mm-hmm. an adventure yeah. when you're abroad. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And and the adventures don't have to be the, the big, like, jumping out of an airplane kind of things. Do you I mean the yeah. adventures can be small things like finding something new to eat or understanding a new way of looking at something or, mm-hmm. uh, do you know what I mean? Or, or actually get it, you know, like managing to get yourself where you need to go on the public transport system. <laughs> With it and, and getting there the first time. <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? Like, all of the, those are all adventures, no? Yeah. Or successfully, like, communicating something to somebody. Exactly. In itself. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The first time you walk into a shop and do all your dealings in Urdu or in Chinese and, you know, and walk out and think, like, I just did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's an adventure, too. Yeah. But you also have to be open to experiencing those things as adventures and and not as obstacles. Right. There are times in in anybody's life when you live as an expat that you know everything is gonna be an obstacle. Right. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, and and there are days when you can deal with obstacles with a smile and other days when you don't smile at obstacles, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I think it, but the, the underlying is just sort of approach to living abroad. Do you know what I mean? If, if you can, in the majority of the cases, see those kinds of things as, a, as adventures rather than as, you know, obstacles or, you know, things that are, trying to put you down. I think that's a big part of it. I, I totally agree with you. I think it's about perspective. And if mm, your perspective yeah. sucks, <laughs> like if your perspective is that, <laughs> oh my God, everything sucks. Nobody can do anything right. And why can't I just get from point A to point B without like having to go around obstacles the entire time, then you're not, you're yeah. not going to make it for very long, probably. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. I really like what Patty had to say. She said, you know, it's so good to have people in every major hub of the world that you can just stop in and visit because, like, we've talked about the the bonds you develop are so strong. Yeah, they're very deep, and the relationships are usually pretty intense, I'd say. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, just from being together in a more challenging environment and, like, problem-solving and team-building, basically, without even going through an obstacle course yeah (laughs) and also you know it's about your perspective right did you have any advice that you would add to that i think she covered it pretty much yeah what about you be patient yeah yeah it takes time and it's not going to be easy right away Mm -hmm. Uh, and it might not be easy Mm -hmm. depending where you're living yeah it's definitely about making adjustments and and also being kind to yourself like be forgiving to yourself when you don't know what's going on yeah because if you get frustrated then you won't be able to like process things as well as if you have a more positive perspective yeah definitely open outlook cool well thank you so much to our guests Yes. Really cool talking to you. It was very interesting to hear your perspectives. Yeah. And uh, we oh we will link to Zahir's podcast in our show notes. Yeah. Very cool. So you have a podcast? I do, yeah. <laughs> and what's it? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. So it's called the Tweedle Z and Tweedle Dom Show. It's not as official as yours because we're not on iTunes. <laughs> uh, we're on SoundCloud. And it's a similar sort of thing. 
expats in Madrid. We literally just get around a table, Dom and I, my co-host, and a guest, someone who fills in for that third spot every week or every time we record. And we literally just, we sit there, we talk about our guests, we talk about, you know, something that's come up in the past week or so. We'll drink, we'll laugh, we'll have a good time, and we'll learn a little bit too. (laughs) Well, well... Do you know what time it is? What time is it, Rachel? It's time to hear a lost in translation story. Awesome. Who's this from? So this is from Nia. She lives in New York. Okay. And let's hear what she said. So the way the story goes is I was studying abroad in Paris and by this point I'd already been a little bit familiar with the area but I'd still only been in Paris for a few days so I knew as much French then as I know now which is nothing but you know everyone says like in Paris and France everyone speaks English everywhere else in the world everyone speaks English so you'll be fine I don't like to rely on that but it does help so one day during lunch or after school or something I needed a spoon I love yogurt I have I'm always eating yogurt but I never have a spoon and our cafeteria was closed and the little cafe on campus was closed so I thought okay I'll I'll just go down the street and ask someone for a spoon because that's what I do in the in the states in New York it's so easy if I don't have a spoon I'll just run into any diner cafe Starbucks McDonald's looking place ask for a spoon they give me one I say thank you and I run out and I leave and I never see them again so in Paris I tried to do this I went um to a couple places around my university I landed in this one place where I thought there's a lot of people in here so I should I should get pretty lucky they should be able to help me I don't like to just start speaking English to people so I asked in very, very broken, terrible French. I asked the guy if he spoke English and he must have said yes, because then I asked, okay, great, Um, do you have a spoon? And he looked at me a little confused and I said, you know, do you have a spoon? And I started doing the movements like if you're slurping soup or, you know, do you have a spoon for yogurt as if you would eat yogurt the universal like hand in a fist pounding the air putting it up to your mouth like gobbling down soup do you have a spoon and he looks at me a little confused and we're not really communicating I'm like okay this isn't working and I asked him a couple more times and he looks at me and in perfect English he goes what is a spoon and I was mortified I was so embarrassed my my attempts at gestures clearly failed this was not working uh thank you so much Nia for your story yes I can totally understand what that's like yes the the mortification (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah I feel like I had something similar recently where someone just couldn't understand what I was saying and I was mm-hmm. just like face bright red. Mhm. Oh yeah. I I mean that happens so much to me here. It's just like a normal everyday thing. Like like I say something to somebody and they're like, "Uh?" and I'm like like a spoon, a spoon, you know, like and then and then it's like, "Okay, translation." <laughs> And, like, repeating the word does not help at all, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I loved your story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was awesome. I'm sure a lot of other people can relate to that as well. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything we have for this week. If you have any experience being an expat and you have something you'd like to add to our discussion if you agree or disagree or you want to give more advice we'd love to hear from you you can leave a comment in our 
that is linked to wherever you're podcasting, languagenerdstoearth.com. Go to episode number 15. Yeah, and uh, please send us uh, your Lost in Translation stories. Mm -hmm. You can send them by the voice recorder on our website, Mm -hmm. or you can email us a voice memo. Mm -hmm. And please subscribe to the podcast. Yeah, that way you can get episodes as they're fresh out the oven when they come out. And uh, follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest. And we also have a blog that you can subscribe to where we like to write about our experiences living and traveling abroad. Yeah. And please, if you have a moment, if you could review the show on iTunes, if you liked it. Mm Mm-hmm. If you don't, don't review it. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Five stars no, only. Kidding, but, <laughs> but that helps people to find us, and we'd really appreciate it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Also, please tell your friends about it if you're enjoying it. That's usually how more people find out about it besides reviews on iTunes. Let them know about how much fun you have listening to us talk. <laughs> and... <laughs> So our next episode is going to be about the evolution of the English language and how it's changed over time. I'm really excited about that. Yes. All right. Well, thanks so much for listening and have a great week.